Marvel doesn't pay enough. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I'm able to do anything else. Use the okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, actually, it's quite a challenge for me to give this talk with my uh, vision science background, but uh, I'll try to do my best. And uh, uh, what I am doing is uh, mostly psychophysics, or the experimental study uh, of human perception and attention using some objective performance measures such as uh, recognition time, reaction time, and so forth. But uh, it seems that uh, some of these methods uh, could be quite useful uh, in the study of uh, the representation of language in the human mind and mostly uh, in the study of our mental lexicon or a sort of a dictionary in our memory uh, containing various sorts of information such as word meaning, uh, pronunciation, syntactic characteristics and so forth. There are uh, lots of questions uh, that could be asked uh, about the mental lexicon and its structure, for example, uh, the question how it is organized, how it develops, uh, how it is implemented in our brain, and uh, the issue we were actually addressing uh, is regarding uh, the various grammatical forms uh, of a certain uh, word, uh, because uh, it's actually a question how they are stored there. Uh, on the on the other hand, it's quite possible that all word forms are stored independently. Uh, but, uh, from the point of view of economy, uh, it's not really a good idea. It's probably easier to store just a default form, uh, for example, nominative form, uh, and to derive uh, everything according to the rules of a certain mental grammar. That, but in this case, we should consider uh, and um, we should uh, suppose that there is uh, this mental grammar in addition to the mental lexicon as it is. And uh, uh, there are uh, at least three approaches, uh, all of them having its own empirical support. Uh, one idea that everything is stored independently. Uh, the other idea that everything is uh, stored, but uh, all word forms are organized uh, as a sort of a cluster of interrelated enters and to activate uh, any of the form you need uh, the activation of the default form or some other form of a word and finally there is an idea that uh, there are both this mental dictionary with uh, default lexemes and uh, mental grammar allowing you to produce all necessary word forms but uh, the situation becomes even a little bit more difficult uh, when we distinguish between uh, two types of morphology. Uh, one allowing to produce uh, new lexemes uh, with uh, new meanings. Uh, I use Russian examples because uh, that's what we used in our studies. Uh, this is derivational morphology and uh, the resulting word sometimes has nothing to do with uh, the sum of the meanings of separate morphemes, uh, which is not in agreement with the compositional rule. Uh, and uh, the other type of morphology then is when you get the same meaning, uh, the same word, but with a new grammatical form, like uh, producing plural or past tense from the present tense or whatever, this is inflectional morphology. So uh, what we decided uh, to study using our psychophysical methods uh, were the following questions. The first uh, one is uh, whether these derived uh, words and word forms are represented in the mental lexicon or constructed there. And the other question is whether the resulting representation are presentations, sorry, are similar or different in derivational morphology and inflectional morphology. And uh, to address uh, these questions, uh, we decided to use the general idea of the information flow in the information processing system. Actually, uh, when we uh, look at this information flow, 
um, we suppose that information is somehow introduced uh, or encoded into the system. This is our bottom-up data or data <laughs> stimulus or data-driven stimulus. Uh, but to be processed, it requires uh, some comparison with our previous experience or memory or mental lexicon. Uh, this is top-down process or conceptually driven process. And as a result, we have the perceptual recognition or perceived or understood or conceptualized words or something like this. I'll try to show you how it works, but um, it's a pity really that uh, I've got <laughs> this hint uh, to the right. Uh, if you can please try to ignore this part of the screen. <laughs> As if it is not there at all. Uh, so now we fixate across here and try to perceive as many letters as we can. Uh, how many letters could you perceive from the first presentation? Okay, three, four, five, yeah. And uh, from the second presentation, which might, might be as long, you'll perceive everything. Uh, this is called the word superiority effect, which means uh, that uh, you recognize letters faster when they are included in the word and you can report on more letters uh, during the very brief presentation. And the word superiority effect was described uh, as far as uh, in the end of the 19th century uh, by one of the first experimental psychologists and psychophysicists, uh, James Mackin Kettle. And uh, what we did, we actually used this idea in our studies, but uh, we used it uh, in quite a strange way. We found a situation where the word superiority becomes a word inferiority. And uh, it is the situation of so-called simultaneity judgments. Uh, when you show a word uh, divided into parts and present them successively with a really brief gap or onset asynchrony, as psychophysicists call it. Uh, there is a period when these parts are presented successively, but you still, uh, still perceive them simultaneously. And uh, for words, uh, this period of subjective simultaneity is longer than for random letters, like this. So you would perceive this as simultaneous for longer durations than something like this. Uh, so what we decided to do is uh, to take Russian words, uh, some of them uh, with separable prefixes uh, and some with uh, separable endings, which refer to derivational and inflectional morphology and to present, present them uh, asynchronously, divided either across the root or at the uh, so-called morphemic seam, uh, the uh, location uh, in the word where morphemes connect to each other. And uh, we also compared this to non-word strings, which were constructed of X symbols. Uh, so in our experiment, we uh, have had six conditions uh, with word split across the root and at the morphemic seam and uh, with different types of the words. Uh, we, mm, we have had, I, I guess, uh, 33 subjects, each performing uh, 528 uh, trials, which is quite typical for psychophysics. And uh, the main result was that uh, of course, uh, you see uh, the, okay, I'll show it this way. For known words, uh, we've got all uh, this shorter period for subjective simultaneous, simultaneity. Here, the extracts still seem simultaneous with the like eight, second, eight millisecond gap between uh, two parts of the stimulus. And for words, this 
period of subjective simultaneity is longer. And uh, what's interesting for words uh, split across the route, uh, the period of subjective simultaneous simultaneity is also longer uh, than for words are uh, split across the morphing. And what's even more interesting uh, when we look at the two types of morphology split at the morphemic scene, uh, the derivational stimuli uh, are still a little bit less simultaneous than a word split uh, between the prefix and the root. So uh, not to learn you to read these complicated graphs, I'll just show the general results, uh, which are that for any cross-section, words are perceived as simultaneous, somewhat longer than non-words, which replicate some of our previous results, uh, which have nothing to do with linguistics. Then uh, words split across the root tend to be perceived as simultaneous longer than words split at the morphemic seams. And uh, surprisingly, uh, words split at the seam between the root and the ending seam a bit more simultaneous than words split at the seam between the prefix and the root, which is contrary to our hypothesis because the bond between the uh, prefix and the root should have been stronger as the resulting word produces new meaning. Uh, but actually, uh, there are a couple of explanations uh, why this might happen. Uh, this may be uh, due to the syllabic structure because when we use derivational stimuli, they agree, the split agrees with the uh, syllabic structure of the word. But when we use inflectional stimuli, the split does not agree with it. Uh, the other thing that has with top-down influences upon visual processing is that prefix always uh, goes first, and the ending always goes last. So the final representation when we present the um, ending first and the preface last, uh, uh, so, sorry, the root last, might be corrected uh, due to this top-down influence as well. So what we decided to do is to try to avoid this confusion, to avoid this influence. And uh, to do this, uh, we search for some other kind of perceptual segregation beyond this temporal segregation of stimuli. Uh, of course, there is a spatial segregation, but it is not suitable for prefixes because you can uh, get the preposition and the noun which com with completely different meanings. Uh, so we decided to use uh, so-called feature segregation. Uh, when you make this split using different colors. Uh, and uh, this feature segregation is uh, somewhat similar uh, in its characteristics to spatial segregation at least. Uh, for example, uh, when you use stimuli like this, um, uh, for example, when I ask you to raise your left hand for A and B and your right hand for C and D and show you letters. So here you try to raise your, yeah? Here. Okay, now. Okay. Now, a little bit difficult. Even a little bit more difficult. <laughs> now it's much easier for the central letter and now as well. So uh, when you separate the flankers uh, from the central letter using either spatial or feature segregation, uh, this makes your information processing uh, easier for the oops, processing of this very stimuli. So, uh, In fact, we discovered that a sort of this thing has been done before. For example, uh, 
Brenda Rapp from John Hopkins University <coughs> uh, tried uh, this sort of things uh, about uh, 20 years ago with uh, derivational morphology and more and less frequent transitions and the morphemic themes. But she didn't uh, compare uh, the split across the root and the split at the seam, and she did not compare derivational and inflectional morphology. So uh, we just uh, repeated our experimental design on this model, but uh, using other performance measures, uh, now reaction time, uh, we had to introduce also some other types of stimuli which provided us with some new data. Uh, in the previous experiment, we used the duration of the subjective simultaneity period. Here, uh, we used uh, the lexical decision time. So we asked our subject to decide whether they saw a word or a non-word of the Russian language, so we used uh, words uh, with existing roots and existing prefixes, uh, which refers to derivational morphology, and words uh, with existing endings and existing roots, which is inflectional morphology. These were from the previous experiment. And we also used four types of non-words uh, with uh, non-existing root and existing prefix, with uh, non-existing prefix and existing roots, and the same about uh, roots and endings. Uh, and we also divided our words and non-words either at the root, existing or not existing, or at the morphemic scene. And uh, we used two colors. Uh, we varied the sequence of the presentation within every word. And uh, we had uh, 64 subjects. And uh, to show you the pre preliminary results of this experimental, uh, series. The first and the most striking result, and that for all segregation types and all types of stimuli, including both words and pseudo words, the so called inflectional stimuli uh, with a root and an ending, either legal or illegal, are classified significantly faster than derivational stimuli. Uh, What's also interesting for words with endings, uh, just for words, uh, color segregation across the root, like this, uh, provides faster recognition than color segregation at the morphemic scene. I consider this to be uh, the result of the stronger bonds within the root, which is understandable as compared to the morphemic scene. But uh, for words with prefixes, for derivational morphology, there was no reaction time difference between uh, color segregation either across the root or at the morphemic scene. But uh, we could say, uh, hooray, that's a great result, but actually uh, the thing that was also interesting and not yet interpreted uh, was that words with prefixes were not classified faster than non-words. And we had the error rate for the stimulus type uh, almost the same as for non words. And actually, now we are trying to understand why this happens. So we are running an experiment with no perceptual segregation at all, but with uh, lexical decision uh, on these nouns in the locative case. Actually, we had to use it uh, to somehow make. Uh, these two types of stimuli equal. We could not use nominative in one case and, for example, instrumental uh, in the other case. But uh, it seems that uh, all these guys are definitely not stored in the mental lexicon because uh, the error rate is absolutely tremendous. And uh, the final pre preliminary result is that with non-word stimuli for Inflectional stimuli, the non-words with non-existing roots are classified as non-words slower than non-words with non-existing endings. This seems quite interesting for me. And for derivational non-word stimuli, still there is no 
correction time difference between non words with non existing roots and non words with non existing prefixes. And uh, still, they don't differ from derivational words. Uh, the conclusion I can draw from here is that inflectional and derivational morphology uh, behave differently under color segregation which probably reflects differences in their representation in the mental lexicon. And uh, the very general conclusions of this talk are first that psychophysical methods adapted from human visual perception and attention studies might be useful for probing into the mental lexicon. And maybe we should say that uh, it also needs a sort of art of interpretation, uh, but I guess the results are quite interpretable. And the second conclusion is that the methods involving temporal segregation and feature segregation of a noun uh, demonstrate differences in sensitivity in distinguishing between derivational and inflectional morphology. And uh, there should be the third conclusion that uh, derivational and inflectional morphology do differ in our mental lexicon, uh, at least in Russian, but uh, I'll be cautious <laughs> and I'll let uh, my linguist colleagues to draw this conclusion. And here are the other authors of this talk, uh, Maria, who actually uh, did all technical work and performed uh, all the experiments. Uh, Olga, um, who provided her tremendous support uh, in the interpretation, interpretation of our results, and the Katerina, uh, uh, who lent us all her experiments, experience with uh, temporal order judgments and simultaneity judgment, and also with the statistical analysis. Uh, so thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll try to answer my question is whether the structure of syllables uh, interferes in any way with the morpheme structures you are uh, st studying uh, <clears throat> Actually, uh, I even mentioned this when discussing the simultaneous judgment data because uh, this is something we could not avoid anyhow. Uh, the stimuli were uh, really thoroughly found uh, and uh, checked uh, with the frequency and uh, letter frequency this seems and whatever but uh, there is something like syllable oh, structure we could not cope with so, but uh, we tried to avoid this confusion using this uh, color segregation with simultaneous presentation i don't know whether it worked but it seems so <laughs> presented a word, uh, split at a certain point uh, successively or simultaneously in the second case, but the split exactly at the fixation point and then it disappeared. And so we asked the question whether the two parts were presented simultaneously uh, and the second experiment whether it was a word or no word. When you have Well, uh, uh, actually, just a minute, I'll show you this. Uh, we did have this artifact because uh, the split was always either uh, 4 plus 2 or 2 plus 4. 
And uh, in this picture, you see that uh, even for non words of the blue and the gray lines, we do have difference between 2 plus 4 and 4 plus 2. And this is something I didn't mention, but I didn't put it in the slide, so we can try to compare. Uh, every sort of this place uh, within it, but we also had to compare somehow the uh, root and ending and a cross root uh, split. So uh, actually, uh, it was the uh, um, <coughs> really a multiple factors analysis of variance. And uh, the things we could talk of with significant differences are all listed here. Uh, have you looked at this distinction between uh, derivational and inflectional morphology in terms of productivity? I mean, uh, inflectional rules are very productive, but derivational rules, many of them are frozen, so we don't use them and uh, have you look at this problem? Uh, actually, uh, what, what we could look at at the, our presentation times, like, uh, you know, eight milliseconds difference and uh, like uh, 500 milliseconds total duration uh, are the structure of resulting representation, not uh, the production itself. So that's something we should probably start it with some other methods and something, of course, we should think of, but uh, currently uh, I could also speak of uh, whether there is a ready word form in the mind which allows you to make this decision or not. And uh, it seems that for inflectional morphology, there is no such form. Uh, still there are uh, still, we need more studies to be sure about it. And I have a small question. If I heard correctly, you mentioned that uh, you believe that all word forms are stored independently in our mental lexicon. Uh, but what do you think about, for example, Finnish language, where each noun may have more than 2,000 forms and each verb may have more than 10,000 verbs? Do we have still all these word forms? Well, in uh, our mental lexicon? Uh, based on our results, I do not believe that they ah, okay. are stored. I believe that yeah. they are constructed. Yeah. But uh, with uh, der uh, derivational morphology, they seem to be stored. I have a small one. Um, uh, to revisit your strange effect that your um, uh, prefix derivations took as long as nonce uh, words. Um, the example that you have provided is an opaque derivation. You uh, strip uh, your prefix. The root is not easily semanticized. Vuber. Uh, but, uh, that, uh, is not semanticized. So uh, you, it may be the uh, effect of uh, the choice of the materials. Mm. Uh, well, actually, uh, the material was really quite limited.